In this video, we'll discuss lighting in RayDK. This video builds on concepts introduced in earlier videos in this series, especially the concepts part and the materials part, though you may still benefit from it even if you haven't already watched those. First, we'll set up a renderer. Make sure the toolkit talks is loaded in your project, and then use the Alt-R shortcut to open the palette and create a Raymarch Render 3D. On the renderer, switch on shadows if they aren't already on. And I'm gonna be using a resolution of 1000 by 1000 so that it fits in the side panel, but feel free to use whatever you want. With the renderer selected, use the Alt-Shift-R shortcut to open the Editor Tools menu. Choose Add Look At Camera. On the camera, set the position to 2, 3, and 5, and then the FOV angle to 70. Next, we'll add an SDF with the material. This isn't the main focus of this video, but we need to set it up before we can get to discussing the lights. Create a plain SDF. And set the offset to negative one. Then create a box frame SDF. and a sphere SDF. Select all three SDFs and open the Editor Tools menu. And under Arrange SDFs, choose Simple Union. Create a modular map. You use the shortcut MM and connect the arranged first input. Then with the modular mat selected, use the editor tools menu. And under diffuse, we're going to choose Orin Nyar. And then do it again. And under specular, we're going to choose GGX. On the diffuse contrib, we're going to set the albedo to 1. And then on the specular, we're going to change the color to 0 0.5, 0 0.5, and 1. And that will help us differentiate those two pieces. And then finally, we're going to connect that material to the renderer. As you're doing these steps, Touch Designer will likely stall a bit as you connect or disconnect things. This is caused by the GPU recompiling code. There is a way that we can improve it somewhat and also improve the performance of it in general. So we'll select both the specular and the diffuse contrib, and then right click this method parameter and choose toggle read only. Then on the arrange, we're gonna do the same thing with this combine parameter. That should speed things up a little bit. This applies an optimization that reduces the amount of code that gets generated. It doesn't work for all parameters and we'll be covering that in more detail in another video. So we now have a scene with a few different SDFs being combined with a material that's using both diffuse and specular shading, with a slight blue tint on the specular to differentiate it. But we're still using the default built-in light in the renderer. To change the light, we'll need to connect a light operator to the renderer. 
create a point light. and connect that to the third input, the light input on the renderer. Oh, the scene gets really dark when we do this, and that's because by default, this light is at zero, 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 which is inside that sphere. So we're gonna change the position to two, three, three. And now we can see things a little bit better. The light operator is being used by the renderer when it shades the scene. But what exactly is it doing? Recall from the concepts video that ROPs answer questions about points in space. In the materials video, we talked about how, as part of the rendering process, when a ray hits a surface, it needs to determine what color that part of the surface should be. And to do that, the renderer packages up some information about the surface, like the normal vector and lighting information, and the materials then use that to calculate the color of the surface. So as part of that, the renderer asks the light operator, what's the color and brightness of the light hitting this point on this surface, and where is the light coming from when it hits that spot on the surface? After the renderer gets the light color in position, if shadows are enabled, it tries to figure out whether the surface spot is in shadow. It does this by marching another ray from the surface to the light position. If it hits anything while it's doing that, that means that the surface is in shadow, which then gets included along with the other data the renderer passes to material so it can figure out the color for the surface. It's worth noting that transform filters, and indeed most filters, don't work if you insert them between the light and the renderer. This is because of how the renderer passes along the surface position versus where the light thinks it is. It's possible that in future versions of the toolkit, this might be supported, but for now, you pretty much always need to directly connect the light to the renderer without having anything between the two. So getting back to the point light, the way that it answers the question from the renderer is to base the color on its color parameter and on its position parameter. When it's choosing the color, it can also use attenuation. So on the point light, we're going to switch on attenuated. Then we're going to change the attenuation start to 5 and the end to 7. Attenuation adjusts the brightness based on how far the point the renderer is asking about is from the light's position. It works pretty much the same way that the attenuation settings work in a regular light comp. Next, we'll talk about varying the light color. We're going to switch attenuation off. Create a color ramp field. And connect it to the color field input on the point light. Then create a wave field and connect that to the coordinate field input on the color map. And on the color ramp, we're going to change the coordinate range from negative one to one, since this wave is producing a sine wave, which goes from negative one to one. Then on the wave field, we're going to increase the period up to 8. Then on the color ramp, we're going to pick two colors, one of them, let's say, orange, and the other one, blue. What we have here is a field that's varying the color of the light depending on the position of the point on the surface that it's hitting. The wave field is using the X part of the position of the surface point to produce a sine wave, which the color ramp field is then mapping into a range of color values. So when the renderer asks the point light for the light color and position, the point light asks the color ramp field 
which in turn asks the wave field, and the color ramp field ends up passing a color back to the light, and that's what it uses for its color, and multiplies that by its color parameter. Next, we'll look at directional light. Create a directional light operator and connect that in place of the point light. Adjust the direction to something like 1.1, 2, and 1. Instead of coming from a single source point, directional light just points in a direction and everything facing that direction gets hit. It's equivalent to the distant light setting in the standard light comp. In some versions of the toolkit, with certain direction settings, there may be an error with the shadow where part of the SDF gets cut out, and that would look something like that. But in version 0.28, later, that's fixed. So how does directional light behave differently than point light? When the renderer asks about a point on a surface for the light color and position, instead of just using a position based on a parameter like the point light does, it takes whatever the position on the surface the renderer is asking about and adds the direction to it. That means that whatever position the renderer asks about, the light is coming from the same direction relative to that spot. Next up is axis light. So create an axis light operator and connect that in place of the directional light. Axis light is sort of like a cross between point light and directional light. It's basically like having an infinitely long neon light tube. By default, it's using the x axis. Let's change that to z and try adjusting the x and y parts of the position. So let's set that y to 2 and position to 1. Note that when it's using the z axis, the z part of the position gets ignored. Similar to the point light, it supports attenuation. So you can switch that on and adjust the attenuation range here, and it will limit how far that light goes. So we can set that to maybe 3 and 6. Next up is the spotlight, which is equivalent to the spot mode setting in a standard light comp. So create a spotlight and connect that in place of the axis light. Increase the Y part of the position to 2 to move the origin point up. And then on the direction, we're going to set that to 0, negative 1, and 0. That's pointing straight down. Then on the cone angle, we're going to set that to 30, and then the cone delta to 10. This controls how wide the spotlight beam is and how sharply it cuts off around the edges. Try adjusting the Z part of the direction now and see how that sweeps the light back and forth. It also supports attenuation, much like point light and axis light. There's a lot of flexibility in the various light operators, but we've still only been using one of them at a time. The multi-light operator provides a way to combine multiple light sources. I'll create a multi-light and connect that in place of the spotlight. Then connect the axis light to the first input 
and the spotlight to the second input. Then on the spotlight, we're going to set the color to 0, 0 0.2, and 1. That will help us differentiate the two. We're now combining the light provided by both of these operators. On the multi-light, we can enable and disable lights quickly without it having to recompile the shader. And there's also a handy level setting to adjust the brightness of each one. When the renderer is trying to figure out the color for a point on a surface, it checks how many lights are connected. For each light that's connected and enabled, it repeats the entire surface shading process, and that includes all of the material calculations, as well as checking for shadows if those are enabled for the light and they're switched on in the scene. Then it adds up the results to produce the final color. This means that using multiple lights in a scene can have a major impact on performance, especially if shadows are enabled. To mitigate that somewhat, we can use bounding volumes to limit where each light applies. Create a sphere SDF. And then on the multi-light, on the second bounds parameter, we're going to drag the sphere onto that. And then increase the radius to 2. So we'll now see how the spotlight is only being used within the bounds of that sphere. So if we were to move that around, it would change which areas are allowed to use the spotlight. Now if you increase the radius up to 3, that's going to cover pretty much all the area that we need since that's where the spotlight is pointed anyway. But the renderer gets to save some computations outside of that area by just skipping that light altogether. And that's it for this section. Thanks for watching and stay tuned for the next video in this series. Check out my Patreon for access to scene files, exclusive tutorials, and more. And as always, make sure to like and subscribe.